everyone. Good evening. Good morning. If you can see me and hear me well, just put a hi in the chat box. Okay, great. Uh, very quickly running you through uh, the rules before I hand it over to Chris for his presentation. Uh, for any questions uh, that you have, we request you to hold on until Chris covers his really exciting presentation on how do you start a lot start up during lockdown. Uh, the session would be about 35 minutes where Chris will be discussing this in detail, after which we open the floor for Q&A from you. Uh, the Q&A need to be typed in the Q&A box and um, all any concerns about the audio or video quality being um, not up to the mark, just let us know in the chat box and we'll try and rectify if uh, any of our servers go down in the in between the session. Uh, thank you so much for taking time out today to attend this session and thank you Chris uh, for being uh, being our guest speaker for today and uh, for volunteering to take this session. I will hand it over to Chris who is the founder of Two Lanterns Advisory to start his uh, presentation. Well, uh, thank you very much. Uh, thanks so much to everyone for joining. Hopefully this is going to be um, illuminating and also helpful to you because uh, the whole idea of a startup is a, a tough one. Um, there's a lot of books about startups. There's a lot of literature about startups. But until you go through actually trying to create one, um, you don't really know what it's like. And so hopefully what I can do is just give you a little bit of a sense of what it was like for me launching a startup uh, during this past lockdown of the last two mo uh, 12 months and give you some ideas about, you know, if you do want to have a startup, what are some of the things to note uh, in creating your own uh, in a lockdown and kind of what also are the skills that are best needed for that startup. So just to give you a little bit of a, a sense of myself. So um, if we go back 12 months or a little bit over 12 months, uh, I was running my own consulting company called Two Lanterns Advisory. I, I've worked in the political risk world, which is basically the future of politics and economics and how it affects business for uh, about seven years at this point. And I started in late 2018 my own company because I thought, you know, I can do this better than my old company. And I was running a lot of in-person workshops. It was really interesting. I was going to the Pentagon to run workshops there. I was teaching at Boston University. I was teaching it. I taught at hedge funds. I was doing really interesting projects. And I was also um, working on a ballot campaign in Massachusetts. I'm from Massachusetts, from Boston. And I was working on this ballot campaign for ranked choice voting, which is a different way of voting they're actually using in the New York City mayoral election in, uh, in a month's time. And it was going to be a big year because I was doing about like 10 or 15 hours a week on the campaign. I was meeting with members of the legislature. I was talking to civic groups, democratic committees, Republican committees. It was going to be, March uh, 2020 was going to be a very busy year for me, managing my company and then working on this campaign. And then uh, well, what do you know, that didn't quite turn out to be correct. So um, what happened is that in my in-person workshops kind of uh, you know dried up uh, because of the lockdown, a lot of them were, were delayed. The campaign that I was working on effectively collapsed, like a lot of our fundraising dried up. And even though we got it back, my department was eliminated and uh, they effectively said, you know, either work for free or, or not at all. And I was like, well, I'm going to do not at all, at least for a little bit. And uh, my work at Boston University was just a lot more work because middle of the semester, we had to transfer um, to online. And as everyone knows, online going from in-person is a lot more extra work. So what I ended up doing, and I think this will be applicable for everyone, is I started rethinking how my business could be. So, you know, I really had to think, is there anything that I'm doing in my consulting business that needs to be a, a different thing? So is there a new service area? Um, I had time to actually read through literature and you know really think about what it is I'm doing. And I also had time to think, um, you know, to talk to folks. And so what happened to me is that around, um, around this time, I started to think for my own consulting company, okay, what is it that I can do to, um, to you know, basically work online? So obviously I was doing a lot of reports and, you know, writing uh, commentary and stuff, and that's easily done remotely. That had always been done remotely. So that wasn't that difficult. The um, uh, the work that I had been doing in terms of some other projects that are in person, well, I can't do that. So I might as well do um, the in-person workshops and go to an online course. 
the some of the reports would go online um, for um, to, there's a, a war gaming type thing called Matrix Games that I, I've done, and I also thought, you know what, I should create an online platform because the the world of political risk is really scattered. It's got folks in business, folks in government, in academia. So I created a platform to try to bring that together. And so that's effectively a software product. That's effectively software as a service, um, in the same way that many many people have a software as a service company. But what I've also done is that. Around the time where I was thinking, oh, I should turn my consulting business and that political angle into a software company, I was talking with a bunch of elected officials in at the state level in, uh, where I am in Massachusetts. And I was talking to one of them, and he was saying, you know, it's really, really hard for him to do his job because he gets like 200, 300 emails a day from his constituents. In, in Massachusetts, um, an elected official will often represent about 40,000 people. Uh, people. So, you know, he's getting uh, hundreds of emails a day. He only had one staffer to handle it. Each one of those emails is a data point about what his district wants, but he can't, you know, he can't uh, digest that. He can't turn that information into data. So he told me basically in a meeting, he's like, I want, uh, I want a software product that is built for me and help me do my job. And I thought, okay, let me try to do that. I had already been, you know, running my own business. I had been learning about software development and the entrepreneurial process. Um, from my own business. And I thought, okay, if there's, if there's a need, let me do it. I'll either, you know, either this fails and it doesn't go anywhere and I go back to my old company or my old company fails and I go over to this. Luckily or unluckily, uh, both have been doing okay and are doing pretty well. So I'm launching Legislata, which is my software as a service for elected officials in July 21, focusing on the United States. Although definitely we want to get to Europe Latin America and India um, sometime in the next couple of years. Um, and to Lance, my old company is, is also going well. So it's a little bit busy right now, but I think that's good. But in that process, in that whole year of uh, trying to raise my, you know, trying to raise funds for my new company, trying to take my old company and build a software product in as little with as little cost as possible, I had to do a lot of researching of the startup literature. And then I basically had to reinvent a lot of what they said because so much of what they said couldn't actually happen during a lockdown. So that what we're going to be talking about now and most of it, uh, I'm happy to answer any questions about it, is kind of what I found are the five steps for launching a startup, particularly, and how to do that during lockdown. And so I'd say if there's one thing to read, uh, it's The Lean Startup by Eric Ries. Uh, that's probably the single best book about how to build a startup. But within that and then with all the other literature, I think there's five key steps. Um, create, getting your idea, doing user research, fundraising for the product, developing the product, and then your go-to-market strategy. These are the five things that if you do them right, you can get from here to a, um, to a startup, <clears throat> even in a lockdown. So the first thing is the idea. This is actually, I found, kind of hard to do in a lockdown because so often the ideas will come from just a casual conversation. So for example, um, Legislator basically came through talking with a state rep about what it is he needed help with. Um, I was kind of fortunate that I had that conversation because I was trying to create my my two lantern software product. And then he basically said, you know, this is a different audience. You need a different product for it. But so many of the ideas come from uh, the best ideas in in software come from talking with actual people who, you know, how's it going? Oh, you hear that they they need something. There's a hassle for them at work or something that your own uh, self is struggling with. I think there's a real problem in the startup world with people will create a product because they can build it. So it's almost like, you know, you hear the thing of, uh, there was one product that I remember being mocked on an uh, American TV show, which was a, a, a thermos, a cup holder, like for, for beverages, that will tell you what the beverage is in real time. And it's internet enabled and it will sync it to your phone. And the, the host, it was Stephen Colbert, he's now a, a famous American talk show host, was making fun of this, be like, you know what's in the in the thermos. You can look at it. You're you're seeing it. There's no reason to have that. But if you are an engineer and you know how to do an internet enabled thing, and you can build some software that can, you know, do a, a chemical analysis of a beverage to tell you whether it's coffee or tea, you're like, oh, this is cool. I can make a thermos that can tell you what's in it. No one actually needs that. The important thing for any soft startup idea is it actually has to have some value. There's way too much stuff out there that is. We have a cool idea. We think we can build it, but should you build it? There's a big difference between you can build something and you should build something. And the best ideas have to solve some real pain point. 
So for uh, Two Lantern, my, my consulting company, that pain point was for me as a political analyst, I can't really keep track of all the news I see. And it's really hard for me to go back and find, find news. So I thought, okay, I'm going to build an, an, uh, a, an app that does that. For Legislata, it was elected officials tell me that they have way too much information. They can't handle it. Okay, I'm going to build an app that solves that. I'm not going to do AI machine learning for it because we don't need that at this point, maybe later, but I'm just going to focus on what's the pain point and then what uh, you can do. Facebook, I think, is the best example of uh, a product that wasn't really understood because folks weren't talking about what actual value was creating. And I actually remember Facebook because I was a freshman in college when Facebook uh, came out. And I was one of the first, apparently, I mean, I, I don't remember this now, but I guess I was one of the first users because it was started by Mark Zuckerberg in Harvard, and then it spread to the to Stanford and the other Ivy League schools. And I went to Brown at the time, um, go go Brown. Um, and I remember people in the hallway, like coming down and saying like, hey, you got to sign up for this thing. It's called Facebook. It's really cool. And I remember thinking like, this is dumb. Why am I going to like go to the effort of making a profile page for some internet directory? And then they said, you can see if the person you like is in a relationship or single. And I remember thinking, well, I'm in that. I am done. And we don't talk about this in the uh, now is what Facebook is. But basically, the early days of Facebook, the way it, it spread on throughout college campuses was that was the single big feature that people were signing up for was you can see if the person you meet at a party is dating someone or not. And Obviously, that's not the pain point now that Facebook's trying to solve. But at the time, when it was an early stage startup at only at colleges, that was the single biggest thing. And if you were a college student, you would say, of course, that's something people care about. But there hadn't been a real product to do that. Um, and even in the early days of Facebook, you know, there wasn't it was kind of weird in the sense that there wasn't much else that you could do with it. Uh, you could poke people, but we didn't really know what that meant. You could create groups, which was kind of fun. And it wasn't until um, my a couple of years later, my junior year, so this would be, um, I guess, fall of 2005 or so, um, that you could upload photos. And that's really when Facebook took off. Um, Facebook took off from, uh, you, know, you know, we we joined it up, then we didn't really start using it for a year and a half, a couple of years later. So think about not where you want to go long term with the product. Think about what is the immediate thing that your initial product, your MVP, minimum viable product, could um, could actually solve. And I think the best way to do that when you're in lockdown is just to think through your own day. What is it the things that you in your day or you in your work, if you're already in a business, is actually kind of a hassle? Um, if you're at a business, maybe it's filing expense reports. Maybe it's checking on your supply chain. If you're not at a business, maybe it's you know ordering from certain restaurants that uh, you know they deliver but they don't have an app. Something like that. Just think about your what it is that is kind of bothering you, and then ask other people the same questions. And that's obviously tough during lockdown to talk to people, but you can actually just go out and if you have some basic idea, you can go out and start talking to people. Which brings us to the second thing you have to do, which is user research. This is. The most important thing I think is really where a lot of startups start to go wrong is that they get a good idea and then you don't actually check to see whether anyone else needs it before you go out and build it. And there's so many startups that you hear of that kind of crash and burn. Um, they raise a lot of money, they have a great idea, and then nothing really happens with them because they didn't do the user research. Um, Zappos is a company. They are basically Amazon for shoes. I think they actually are bought by Amazon where they had an idea that people want to order shoes online. And they didn't actually build any sort of online delivery platform when they started. They had a website that said, you know, here are all the shoes. They got a shoe catalog or something and they loaded it up and they say, you know, order the shoe, order the size, click here to pay. And then the people at Zappos actually went out to a shoe store, bought the shoe that they had just been ordered, and then put it in the mail. There was zero warehousing, zero inventory. They didn't do anything. They were basically um, Yelp or uh, Deliveroo or DoorDash for shoes. It was just a, an actual human being going to a store, buying it, which the person could have done. But they did that because they wanted to see whether or not there was a market for people who want to buy shoes online. Um, so what you want to do is you talk to as many people who might be users of that product. What I did for, for legislative, because it was elected official, I'm not an elected official. I emailed a, a lot of them. I emailed everyone I've, I really had worked with on, 
the various campaigns. I cold emailed people. I found uh, lists of of state legislators. I got a free mail merge system for Google Sheets, and I just said uh, I just sent out emails like fifty a day and just cold got some people writing back. And what that does is it not only tells you whether the idea is valid or not, and if no one likes the idea, it's a good sign that you either shouldn't proceed with it or you should at least try to recalculate it a bit. Um, it can also tell you what features to build. So I, for example, on Legislata, I had a really long feature set of what we could build that I thought an elected official might want to use. And what I did in every single user interview was I asked them, what's the feature that you would want the most out of these? And I kind of gave them the list. And what's the feature that you would like the least that you don't really care about? And what that showed me was, you know, the kind of the ranking of the features in terms of the utility. So when I went out and got a developer, uh, I was able to tell them, okay, you know, I don't have all the money in the world. I have a budget of about $40,000 to build the, the first version. What of this set of features can we actually fit in? Uh, a forty thousand dollar budget. We said, you know, here's feature number one, which everyone really wants. We need that. How many? How much would each feature cost? And we basically just went down. You know, number one will cost twenty thousand, so we'll have that. Number two costs ten. Number three costs five. Number four costs five. Okay, we're at the budget. We stop there. So user research is absolutely crucial to doing that. And when you're in lockdown, that's obviously really tough to do. So what I would recommend, uh, what I did is basically cold outreach to people if you do have a specific target market. Um, you can join networking groups, even the, you know, the harshest lockdowns, generally people still want to get together in some kind of networking groups. You can send people LinkedIn messages. I've done that for my products. You send them Twitter DMs um, and also just reach out to friends. But, and the, you know, what you can certainly do is what Zappos did is you kind of build the product, but not really. So what you're effectively doing is just testing out whether people want to actually want that product. So you can build a landing page, you can, you know, uh, send out a press release, you can do a Kickstarter campaign or a, a GoFundMe campaign, any of those kind of crowdsourcing campaigns, just get some sense from the market, whether or not people want to buy this, because I can guarantee you, you will be way more interested in this than anyone else in the world. Um, now, what do you do? Let's assume you've gone through uh, you've got an idea. It's a really good idea. And then you've uh, raised, uh, then, then you've, uh, you've got your user research and you're pretty sure that people actually want this product. Well, then you've got to fundraise. Now that I would say is the hardest step to do remotely. Just to give you some background, I started fundraising in October and I just got the first money in my bank account uh, this past week. So it took from October till the middle of May to start this whole process. And that was actually relatively easy because I, um, I was very lucky enough that as I was starting my, my Legislata product and starting the fundraising outreach, a friend of mine was starting a group of angel investors in Boston who were interested in better government. So it was really convenient in that I said to him, hey, I got this product. I was just, he's a friend of mine. I was talking to him. I was like, hey, I'm going to start fundraising. He goes, well, we're looking for companies to start funding. Why don't you present to us? And they have contributed, I don't know, of the of the 168,000, they've probably contributed about 130,000 of what I've I've raised. So that single group was really, really helpful. And that was just kind of luck. So I would say if you can figure out a way to avoid having to fundraise during lockdown, just because it is the absolute hardest thing to do. DJS Antibodies is a biotech company in England. And they um, have a really interesting story because biotech is probably the most capital intensive uh, sector in, in any real you know, part of the world other than maybe manufacturing, because maybe even more than manufacturing, because they are a company that um, tries to help develop uh, better antibody approaches for various immunotherapies. So you have some sort of disease. What uh, their approaches do is they basically trigger your immune system to tackle that disease. So in the same way that we're you know, getting vaccines against coronavirus, they're effectively creating vaccines against things that um, aren't usually getting vaccinated. So for example, they have there's tricks in immunotherapy that you basically boost your immune system. So, um, so uh, your immune system attacks cancer cells, for example, and then you can actually beat cancer with your own immune system with you know, this very elaborate process, which is very capital intensive because there's a ton of research that needs to be done. A lot of basic science, a lot of rat lab research. You got to do 
uh, tests on the su- on uh, non-human subjects, tests on human subjects. You have to go through a whole regulatory process. So it's an incredibly, incredibly capital intensive uh, process doing anything in the biotech sector. So what he did uh, was he was a graduate student at Oxford. I uh, was a friend of mine. Um, he first started, founded the company with a couple friends of his so that immediately they had three people and that they could actually go and, and be credible. They then started to do fundraising through the university and then through various grant programs through the university. They then um, have gone through various um, uh, government programs because obviously the government wants to help cure disease or at least a number of health agencies do. So they went to government programs to try to get non-dilutive uh, funding, meaning that you don't have to give the government any shares. The government will just give you the money and then either you pay it back or you don't pay it back. And from there, they built up enough credibility that they could go to venture capital. And they now have gotten a, a pretty big round of fundraising. They've got investors, they've got employees. They're, they're now on their way, but it started from basically taking their fundraising approach. And rather than saying, you know, we're a biotech company, we need $100 million to develop a, a drug that is going to hit the market. They said, okay, we need $50,000 to have our first paper, uh, scientific paper written. Then they, they got that, they got the paper, and then they said, okay, we need $250,000 to hire our first employee. They got that from the government. And so what you can do is try to, try to step that, um, do that kind of iterative stepwise fashion. And obviously, the best thing you can do is just to bootstrap if you're able to do so. If you can find a partner, who, if you're a non-technical founder and you want to make some software, you can find a technical partner and try to give that person you know, half of the company or give them some equity. Um, if you can't bootstrap, uh, then you have to create a budget. And this is really important uh, in lockdown because... Um, there's all this is important to do in lockdown because once you hit the real world, it can get very easy to just throw money at problems. So I'd say when you don't have those pressures on you, go through the budget, cut anything unnecessary. And then if you do have to raise money, now that you've tried to bootstrap and you've bootstrapped as much as you could, and sorry uh, if this is American jargon, bootstrapping is trying to build a product without any outside funding. Um, if you've tried to build a product without any outside funding, you said, you know, I can't do it. I actually need a budget. And then you've really gone through and cut the budget down to the absolute minimum possible. And obviously you're going to be building that on, um, uh, you know, doing that with user research to find what is actually necessary. Then you have to go get money. Now, the easiest way to get money is friends and family because they know you and they hopefully believe in you. Um, and then the last thing to do is reach out to venture capital. Uh, if you're in a city with a, a strong angel uh, investment community, definitely uh, go for them because they often have a, you know, as in, uh, intimidating as venture capital, they're not as sophisticated as venture capital. So you can tend to get a little money a little bit more easily. Um, so the last thing you want to do is reach out to venture capital. In terms of the actual logistics of fundraising, that gets into a lot of technical detail, but I definitely recommend um, there's a thing called a safe note, which is a simple agreement for future equity, or a convertible note, which is effectively a loan. That way you don't have to have a valuation on your funding. If you do have to do an equity round, as, as I did, you will have to come up with some kind of valuation. And that is always tricky to do. Um, you can look around what's in the rest of the market. This is actually relatively easy in lockdown. It's not that uh, it's not hurt by being locked down to see what's around the rest of the market, what the usual prices are. But a lot of it is actually just bargaining with with your investors. So you definitely, if you do have to get investment, try to get as many investors as possible interested so that you can basically try to set the price or negotiate over the price. So if you say, my company's worth a million dollars, and the VC says, no, it's worth half a million dollars, but you have another VC interested who says, yeah, sure, it's a million dollars, then they they set the market price. So it is a weird thing trying to fundraise when you're early stage if you do have to set a priced equity round, because all those prices are, of course, completely meaningless. You have no data to back it up. You probably have no sales yet. So it is really just about uh, constructing an argument of why this is a certain price. Um, and that could be others in the market are like this. It could be that we have a 1% chance of getting a $100 million valuation, so it's $1 million. Or it could be where you know, we have some traction and this is why we think it's, it's where it is. So that's a whole separate thing of valuation. I definitely recommend if you get to this point to do a lot more research on that. But um, just the general point is that 
if you do have to raise money, always make sure that you raise it on as favorable terms as possible to yourself. Okay, so now let's assume that you've, you've done all this process and now you actually need to build the product. Well, lockdown is actually really good for that, that process because you can spend a lot of time working on the product and not having to, you know, given that everyone's kind of stuck indoors, um, you have time to do that, assuming that you are having a product that you can, you can uh, stick indoors. Now, you're probably going to have to do multiple iterations of this product. You're probably going to have to test one when it's, uh, when it's deployed. And one of the most important things, it, I, the, probably the single most important thing to stress with an early stage startup, is that you're not trying to build a product to succeed. You're trying to build a product to learn more about your market. PayPal is, I think, the best example of this. Now, PayPal is one of the most successful companies in the world. And not only that, but a lot of the folks who worked at PayPal are some of the richest people in the world. So Elon Musk, for example, who I believe is still the wealthiest person in the world right now, he got to start working at PayPal. Peter Thiel, who was an investor at Facebook, I believe Reid Hoffman, who was early at LinkedIn, I'm, I'm pretty sure he was also at PayPal. PayPal basically has been uh, one of the kind of breeding grounds for Silicon Valley billionaires. But we don't remember this. It took like three or four attempts to them to actually have a product that worked. The first thing of PayPal was supposed to be that you could uh, send money via Palm Pilots. Palm Pilot was like an early version of the iPhone. It was a, um, uh, it was effectively like imagine the iPhone, but doesn't have phone or music or video. It was just you can keep you know uh, contact information and other stuff and. Uh, I think you could send emails with it, but it was really janky and didn't really work. Um, their thought was, oh, we could send, have people send money via uh, PayPal, uh, via it, uh, with those Palm Pilots, so people are carrying them, and very similar to how Venmo works right now. Uh, that didn't work. There weren't enough people with PayPal, there, uh, with Palm Pilots, there wasn't enough interest. So then they started a different product and that didn't really work. Then they started another one, that didn't work. Then what they figured was, there was this thing called eBay out there, which was uh, doing pretty well, but it was a real hassle to send payments online because it, it, was, it wasn't secure. The American banking system didn't make it easy to transfer money. And they said, what if we tried to be the payment solutions for eBay? So when you buy a product on eBay, rather than having to connect your bank account with another one's bank account or send a transfer or a wire or mail a check, you send money via PayPal. You basically load up your PayPal account, you connect it to your bank account, all PayPal accounts are really easily connected. It's a much simpler process. All of a sudden that worked out. It took them a few years to actually figure that out. But their initial idea of uh, payments via Palm Pilots was extremely different than their what PayPal eventually became and made them millionaires and billionaires, which was the payment solution for eBay. And the important thing I think to note there is that this could have been the story of yet another failed startup that tried to, you know, do payments via PayPal and it just didn't work. It was like 10 or 15 years too soon, but they didn't just have that product. They had an idea of a general area, which was that payments should be simpler. And they kept iterating until they found a, a way that you can take that general idea, payments should be simpler and deliver it into actual revenue and money. So what you're trying to do when you develop in a lockdown or in any times, definitely a lockdown is just try to, to learn. So when you're developing the product, don't just think about, am I developing this for the final version? Think about what is it that you need to know in order to have a product be really successful and then build to that. So for example, with me and, and Legislata, um, I know there's a lot of features that I, I might need, but I, I'm pretty sure that there's one feature that is going to be 50% of the usage of, of the app. So I'm building that product first. And I'm kind of only, I'm doing a few others, but like, that's the main thing that I'm building. And I'm really just building that and enough other ancillary features to make that really useful. And really all I'm trying to do is just learn, will people pay money uh, at the price I've set for that feature? And if they will, well, then I have a great product. I'm going to sell a lot and I can keep building more features. If they're not willing to pay that, well, then I've got a real problem because that was the main feature I'm, I, I have. So that's really what I'm trying to do. It's I'm developing the product, I'm building it, I'm deploying it, and then I'm having a two-month beta test really just to see, do they like that single feature so that I can learn uh, better. Now, let's assume that you've done your startup, you've developed, and now you want to launch, but we're in a lockdown, you can't launch. That's a 
kind of a, a big problem, especially for certain products. And there's one product here called Pomp and Whimsy, which is um, a small American gin company that I, I got to know the founder of. Um, we're part of a, a similar networking group. And they, this, the lockdown hit them probably harder than uh, you know, most other, other companies out there because they're a liquor business. And so a lot of their sales come from restaurants and bars. And when COVID hit, those are the first two things to be shut down. So how do you sell a new, you know, and this is a new style of, of liquor if the places that people drink aren't doing it. And if your main marketing efforts were, uh, at least in their case, were a lot of in-person events. So they would have a, a tasting at a, a liquor store. They'd have a, a event at a bar. They'd do something else. And really their entire business model effectively shut down overnight. And I, I can sympathize because my in-person workshop model also shut down overnight. Well, I think the answer is obviously you want to translate everything that you can to virtual. So if it's that you can translate it one-to-one -to, -one to virtual, so they've had uh, virtual events, which is basically on Zoom, uh, that well, that's easiest because it requires a less uh, difference. But really, I think the thing to think about is what is it you're, that you get out of an in-person event or whatever your in-person go-to-market strategy is? and what of that is the best way to deliver it online? So for example, um, you know, my, um, my go-to-market strategy for legislator in once lockdowns over is going to be a lot of uh, live demonstrations at state houses across the country. I'm going to have an event. I'll put out uh, some lunch and I will um, uh, put out lunch. I'll do have the demonstration. I'll talk to people and I can't do that during lockdown. So, well, the thought is, okay, what is it I'm trying to achieve there? Well, I'm trying to, show people the product and what it can do. And I'm trying to help them have a better understanding of what it is that it can help them in their daily lives. So what we're going to do is rather than just having virtual demonstrations, which we could do, but I don't think that'd be very effective. We're going to shoot a lot of, of short videos showing different parts of the product and really showing how it helps them. So that's really what we're trying to do is to say the purpose of our in-person stuff is to demonstrate the value. So what we're going to do is demonstrate the value in the best way possible. Definitely would say don't spend on advertising if you don't have to, um, because obviously that's just running down money. And, and when you're running a startup, money is the most valuable commodity. You have money and time. Um, and you can also try to tap into as many online platforms as you can. So if you, for example, are making, um, let's say you're making toys uh, and you need you know, so your market is kids and their parents, well, then YouTube might be useful because I know, at least in the United States, there's a lot of great kids programming on YouTube and there's actually kind of YouTube for kids. So that might be a really easy way to do it. If you're, um, if you're targeting more professional market, maybe it's LinkedIn. If you want to get involved in more uh, consumer-facing products, maybe Facebook or Twitter. So just think to yourself, who are you trying to, to target? And another thing, and I, I see here, who, how do I target the right kind of customers who are really in need of my product? That is perhaps the most important part of your go-to-market strategy is to be open to refinement. So one thing to do, and really, you know, this is, um, you know, as I said, when you're doing a startup, what you're really doing is learning. You're experimenting and learning about how to uh, create your product. Look at the world. Think about who could use your product. Then narrow that down with who really needs your product. And then narrow that down even further to who needs your product and you can reach them. And that should be the target audience. And you might not know that. You might not know who really needs your product. So maybe at the start, you cast a really wide net. You, you know, put up uh, some Facebook ads that aren't that targeted. And then you get the analysis back. And I, I know I just said don't spend on advertising, but, you know, a small spend can actually be useful if it's generating information. Because you do a small spend, you find, oh, wow, it's interesting. Um, you know, men 18 to 34 clicked on my ad way more than every other demographic group. Okay, I'm going to target them more. Then you run another ad and you refine it. So, okay, it's men 18 to 24 who live in this city did it uh, or really did that. And all of a sudden, you now have a much smaller target audience that you can launch with. Because your go-to-market, just remember, if you're trying to start a billion-dollar company, no billion-dollar company starts off with a billion dollars. You start off with a few dollars or whatever other currency you're working in. So always try to figure out who is the early adopter of your product. Who's the one that can get you from where you are now, you know, zero to where you can sustain a few employees or where you can get the data to go to venture capital um, 
and say, you know, yes, I have it. So for me, uh, with legislative, it's for elected officials. And at least in the United States, that's uh, really divided my target audience between municipal elected officials at you know, the cities or the towns and state elected officials. And I know that state elected officials are going to be my early adopters because they're more professional. Um, they're more professional. They have more staff. They just do do this work, you know, nine to five rather than city officials who are often volunteering their time. So even though my company is dependent on, at least the revenue projections are dependent on selling to a lot of city and town officials, I know that states are where I at least want to start. So those are my my starting um, area. And so my go-to-market strategy is about targeting that uh, initial uh, set of, of funds. So really that's what I wanted to stress today, and I'll leave this slide up because I think it's really the most important thing to remember is that when you're when you're launching your company, you really have to go through these five steps. And at each at each step, if there's a good reason not to do your company, then either don't do it or change the product because there are so many ways that you can so many companies that could exist that just shouldn't um, that are going to fail. Nine out of ten startups do fail, and so. Try to make sure that when you go through this, that whatever idea you have can actually make their way through each one of these steps. So, you, you know, you might have, let's say it's a, a delivery app for, for restaurants. Is that a good idea? Because, you know, you have a trouble getting deliveries. Sure. Do the users like it? Yes. Can you raise enough money for it or do it yourself? Yes. You can actually build it. Yes. And then you can get restaurants and customers on board. Yes. Okay. Then you have a good product. And uh, if you don't, well, then you got to change it. But the nice thing about a startup is that this is your company. Uh, this is your idea. So if you're halfway through it and you realize no one's going to fund your delivery app because there are too many others, well, maybe someone will fund your you know, nonprofit delivery app that's all about helping underserved uh, communities get access to better nutrition. It might be a very similar product. You know, You can build the same thing and you just basically slap a different label on it, target a different market. All of a sudden, people want to fund that. So always be willing to pivot and change. And at least that's what I've seen during lockdown. It's hard to get that feedback. So you really have to go out of your way in order to do that. So that's the presentation. Happy to now take any more any, any questions you have uh, for the rest of this time. Thanks a lot, Chris. This uh, was really, really insightful. I do think I learned a little more about the PayPal history uh, than I did before. Uh, so it's always interesting to know about uh, the stories of startup, of how they started and how they've grown over the years to be where they are today. And um, one good thing that you pointed out is don't get married to your idea. Of course, iterate and ideate again and do go to user research and user testing till you find the right product. Yes. So well, one thing I'll, I'll mention about PayPal is I know we've talked about some successful companies. Go like do a lot of reading about unsuccessful companies because successful it's that Dostoevsky line. Successful companies are all kind of the same, but it's the unsuccessful companies that really tell you what's going on. So I'd say like watch the WeWork documentary if you have access to it. I know there's one. Even watch the Fire Festival documentary that was on Netflix and Hulu. I don't know if you're aware of that, but Fire Festival was this music festival in the Bahamas that Ja Rule was promoting. That. Um, basically collapsed. It was a complete fraud. The person who behind it is in jail. But, you know, watch, watch those documentaries, figure out, um, figure out, you know, the, the Theranos documentary, which is a biotech company, which was also a fraud. Learn from all the things that failed and try to figure out where, how did they fail? And could you have done it differently? So for example, if, yeah, if you have a, if, if you see a documentary about a, a, a software company, um, that failed, like, was it the marketing strategy? Was it there, the product didn't work? Was there something else? Just go through all of those because you're you're probably going to run into similar things. And so that's obviously the best way to avoid it is just to think about it in advance. Perfect. For those of you asking um, if we can get the uh, the slides, etc., cetera, we'll, uh, we'll be sharing a recording link uh, with you after the session ends. You can re-listen. Uh, to the recording to to yeah. store all the learnings that you heard Chris speak. Great. Yeah. Um, all right. Um, before <laughs> before we move into questions, can I just uh, chip in uh, chip in about what Upgrad does, Chris? Yes, absolutely. 
Great. Uh, so, um, hi everybody. This this session was possible thanks to Upgrad, and uh, we are a online higher education provider, and we currently have about forty thousand active learners on our platform with, from eighty five plus countries, and we've got courses across management, data science, machine learning, and AI, and uh, we have all forms of courses as well, starting from certifications to executive programs to master's degree, which bring in the best knowledge of, of industry because our programs are meant exclusively for uh, working professionals who really uh, don't get the time to to do their lifelong learning and, and upskilling journey with, with the tremendous amount of work they do. But our courses are designed in a way that you can carry on your work and learning together and learning shouldn't ever stop. So uh, that's who we are as Upgrad. And because Chris was talking about funding, etc., we're currently a $850 million valued startup. And, uh, <laughs> and, uh, and we're still growing. So, uh, so yeah, and it has been a journey for Upgrad across all of these, from idea, ideation to research, uh, to raising fun and developing and going to market uh, since the last six years that we've been live, and um, and it'll be uh, it'll be really nice if if some few could could join us as learners in the near future. And I think that's a great example of you know when you said it's a it's an online platform for working professionals. It's a great example of you know it's an idea about a niche that isn't being met, and there's a need, there's a pain point out there for people who are at work. Um, and want to learn more, want to learn, you know, if, if you want to start up, but you don't know how to do any user research, or you don't know how to develop a product, you need to learn that. And, uh, you know, there's not always ways, easy ways to do that. So I think that's upgrades, not only obviously selling uh, the ability to, to access new skills and upskill yourself. There's also an example of how startups can function and, and grow and head towards that, that unicorn status of 1 billion valuation. Right, and and a lot of what what Chris uh, what you mentioned is a part of our our product management, digital marketing, and the MBA program as well, where these are sort of taken up in more depth. Right, you spoke about the early adopters. That's usually a customer lifecycle graph, right? And, and uh, if you want to understand what the customer lifetime value would be, CLV, etc., like more more detailed terms, uh, would of course be be a part of of the program as well. So yeah, thank you for for this. I will uh, move on to questions, and uh, do you want me to pick up the ones I think um, would be sure, perfect? sure, yeah, uh, sure. So one of the questions is, how do you target the right kind of customers who would be really in need of my product? Like, how do I reach them in the first place? So I think there's well, there's there's yeah, there's two things. You need to figure out who they are. So that's part of your user research. Um, it's also part of your go-to-market research. So yeah, figure out in the world of what is it, seven billion people, who is it the ones that actually need it? And that could be a geographic uh, division. It could be a functional division. So you say I'm targeting CFOs in southern India, or I'm targeting CEOs in northern, you know, whatever it is that it is. You try to figure out uh, what are the distinctions between them and everyone else. So. For example, myself, I've said for my early users, it is elected officials at the state level with high constituent need districts, which basically means lower income than average, because that, that's what they often do. So that basically takes the world. And then I say, I want to start in states that are within one hour driving distance of me. So that takes the whole world of elected officials, shrinks it down into a geographical sense, shrinks it down to one level of government, and then shrinks it further to... Um, you know, districts that are less than 80% of the average GDP per capita. So then I have a target of that's much more manageable. So definitely get your manageable stuff. Then when it comes to how do you reach them in your go-to-market strategy, what you want to figure out is, is there any, um, is there any way, uh, any venue that they kind of all communicate in? So let's say you wanted to talk to young people. Um, you would, okay. Uh, college and university campuses. That's where a lot of them congregate. Or it's TikTok or Snapchat or I don't know, whatever the new app is. Uh, you know, if you could say, you know, I want to target uh, young people for my product and I know that TikTok really skews young, 
then I'm going to advertise on TikTok rather than Facebook. Yeah. So it's really trying to figure out where is the best way to access that particular market. Again, there's no uh, single way to do that. It's just a lot of research and trying to find out uh, where you can do it and also where you can do it for the least amount of money. So um, uh, you might not know this, but P Diddy or Puff Daddy, um, the American rapper, he got his start uh, uh, he got to start as a producer helping the notorious B.I.G. in Brooklyn, Biggie, Biggie Smalls. And the way he did that is he realized there was a lot of young kids who liked going to concerts. They wanted free tickets and he could just pay them to uh, go flyer a neighborhood, put flyers up about a concert and have like a ton of uh, basically free advertising because these kids didn't really cost much money to pay them for it. Uh, there was a ton of free advertising all around the venue. And because it was you know, a, a live concert, people who were going to the concert had to live geographically close anyway. So rather than him saying everyone reads you know, the source, which is the main rap magazine, and therefore I should target there, well, that costs a lot of money. So what, however you're going to target, it's can you get there and can you get there with the least amount of money possible? Makes a lot of sense. Thank you for that. Uh, Jaleel is asking, is it advisable to use B2B platforms to search for international buyers for agro commodities, or is it good to search on LinkedIn and send them emails? Yeah, um, that is a great question. I, I don't know much about the agricultural uh, market. What I would say, though, is that it's certainly advisable to use B2B platforms like LinkedIn to get some user research going. So I was listening actually to a, a podcast recently about the shipping industry. And there's a, a startup in, in San Francisco called Flexport, which tries to basically take the global shipping industry and make, make it much more manageable, turn it into you know, data science with machine learning. And um, you know, that's an industry that's really hard to, to wrap your head around. It's, it's global, it's old, it's slow. Um, you know, it's putting stuff on giant ships and then sailing across the ocean. So it's a really hard thing to do. But I'm, I, I can tell you that, you know, I'm sure he talked to a lot of people in the shipping industry about what it is they need before he even did anything. So before you try to get a buyer for an agricultural commodity, which is obviously going to be tricky, involve a lot of money, definitely talk to them about, you know, what it is that they need. Um, and so if they do say like, you know what, I'm good with my my commodity purchase cycle, but I really want a better future system to know how the agriculture is going to, you know, what the supplies are going to be in the next six months based on weather patterns. Maybe that's something that you can go. So I would say definitely um, go into as small a niche as you can and then grow from there because it's just a lot easier. So, um, you know, uh, a, a hedge fund, for example, you know, probably shouldn't start trading. I know there's hedge funds similar to a startup, even in the financial sector, don't start trading stocks around the world, figure out what it is that you can trade that you know better than anyone else. Because that's another thing. It's not just, can you do this? But why would anyone buy this product from you rather than for some, from someone else? Um, that, that's also an argument you have to have. And if you can say, well, I'm the only one in this niche, it's a much easier uh, sales pitch to have. Perfect. Uh, I, I think what the follow-up question to that was, can... Uh, I think let me just see. Yeah, it's like, is going to agro commodities a good idea for a startup in Germany? Um, in Europe, I am I'm not very sure of uh, the need for agro commodities, so I won't be able to answer that. Um, I, I don't I don't know. I'm you actually probably know more about agricultural commodities, uh, Jill, Jill, than I do. Um, so I'm not sure, but definitely in that world, there's I'm sure there's opportunities. For startups, it's just really what is it that needs to be done in that world? What's the pain point? Go and find that, and then you can build a startup around that. Hi, Chris. There's there's one question from Amit, which is interesting. It's sort of starting a business. Is it good to invest in in startups? Uh, well, it depends on how much money you have, because it's definitely risky. And I I have a one of my investors. He's an entrepreneur of his own. He said that he's repeatedly turned down money from people because he didn't think they could afford to lose it. So only invest money that you're able to lose. Um, because, you know, if, if you're investing a million dollars in a startup and then it's one of the nine and 10 startups that fails, you've just lost a million dollars. So that's really bad if you only have a million dollars and it's not that big a deal if you have a billion dollars. 
So only invest the money that you can afford to lose or uh, join together with other people to try to diversify your portfolio. So for example, my, my investors, my primary sort of investors, they're part of a group that will invest in five or so businesses, I think every single year. So what they're, or if you're in part of an angel group, they might invest in 10 businesses over the course of a year. So even, and this is what venture capital does. They know that most of their businesses are going to fail. They know that a couple of them are going to basically break even. And then they expect, or they hope that one of them does, you know, what Upgrad did and goes, you know, a hundred X return. And that's their whole portfolio basis is like you invest in 10 companies. One of them is the next Facebook and gives you all your profits. So if you're going to invest in that, you might not invest the same money, uh, same levels of money as as a VC fund, but definitely try to have the same approach where you're going to invest in 10 different ones so that it doesn't matter if one of them goes bust. Perfect. Thank you, Chris. Um, there's one person who's asking, um, is equity funding uh, better or, or debt funding? Uh, I, yeah, I think it depends on... Um, it depends on the company. It also depends on what your investors want. So debt funding, and I think I would include a convertible note like this because that is basically a loan. Um, that is, I'd say, the best because you're, it's simpler. You don't need to have a valuation on it. So like, uh, you know, convertible note might say um, a cap of uh, $4 million and a discount rate of 20 So you're basically saying anything between 0 and $4 million of the valuation is what you'll get. And we're not going to decide on that until later when we have more information. Uh, some people want, to, they just prefer equity funding because they think that, you know, the, the, the cap is too high. You know, they're like, you know, this clearly is not going to be a $4 million company. It's going to be lower. And I don't want you to keep waiting on your equity round to push it to 4 million. I want it to be at, you know, 1 million where I think it is. So there's really, I think, no single right answer. I'd say go with whatever is cheaper to issue and whatever both parties are willing to uh, agree on a number. Because if you can't agree on a number, debt is obviously better. It, it delays the conversation about pricing. But if you're pretty sure that, you know, you're going to be very different on your on your agreement for what the price is, it, maybe you just get, just do the equity round uh, initially. What I will say though is, you know, there's only 100% of a company available. So don't, uh, don't give away too much at the beginning. Like if you have an idea and you're, you think it's a good idea and someone comes along and says, yeah, I'll give you $10,000 to build the MVP and I want 50%. Well, that's not a good idea because the next set of investors that come along, you, you go from 50 to 40 and then the next, and then you get, uh, you know, you have a billion dollar company and you're walking away with, you know, $2 because you've diluted yourself so much over the years. So definitely, hold on to as much equity as you can at every single turn and just uh, let that be one of the things that you are willing to push back on. You reminded me of the movie, The Intern. So yeah, mm -hmm. the, yeah. It, it's a good movie. Uh, someone, is, that, is that the one with Vi uh, Vince Vaughn or the one with Ro uh, Robert De Niro? So uh, no, it's Anne Hathaway. So um, the Anne Hathaway but, and Robert yeah. So I think the person who has this question should should actually watch that and uh, exactly, it's what Chris is just talking about. Um, great. Uh, next question: How do how to make sure that your idea isn't stolen by someone else? Uh, does it happen that a VC or an employee, uh, you know, start a different company with the same idea? Yes, yeah, so this is a huge, huge problem in the venture world. Well, uh, so okay, there's two answers. One is that it's not a big problem because there's lots of ideas, and it's often mostly about execution. Um, so let's say, for example, I'm willing to say that I have a software for elected officials. Other people might take that idea and try to build it. So, but then again, you know, the idea is you can go to government and say, yeah, here's a group of people. I'm going to build it. It's really a lot about the execution. It's about, can we reach the elected officials? Do they trust us? Is it secure? All the things about the execution. So on the one hand, don't be too over secure about your idea. On the other hand, you're right. At, certainly at the beginning, the idea is all you have. So if you have an idea, I don't, I don't know. It's a, it's a social network for some group, you know, group X, and you're going to have the social network and you're talking about it and you're advertising it. Um, Facebook could just take it and steal that and do it like clubhouse. I don't know if you're familiar with the app clubhouse. It, 
has a multi-billion dollar valuation. And it's basically, you can listen in on panel discussions. And you may have seen Facebook now has an ability to have audio panel discussions. Uh, Twitter has a thing called Faces, which is basically a Clubhouse ripoff. So I'm sure that if Clubhouse hadn't hadn't gotten started, actually built up momentum, built up users, they would have been absolutely crushed at the very beginning. So definitely it is a concern. And I would just say, talk to the people you have to talk to about it, be willing to do user research, but probably don't advertise it um, too soon. If you do, if it is about the idea, if it's saying, you know, we have a social network, but it's better than all the others because we're, we're really good and our technology is great, then it doesn't really matter. But if you say like, we have a specific tool that will revolutionize everything and no one else has ever thought about it and it could be duplicated in a day, then yeah, definitely be concerned about that. Perfect. Thanks a lot, Chris. Uh, what are the four key questions for creating a go-to-market strategy? If you could. Um, sure. So I would say, well, here's the go-to-market strategy slide. I'd say there's four key questions, um, or there's some key questions, which is, uh, and I'm sure there's like a, a startup book that actually has this written out uh, like much more clearly as actual full ones. But basically, how are you going to get your product uh, on the minds of your potential customers? How are you going to get your product to your potential customers? Is it software that they download or they have to mail it? Um, how are you going to convince them to pay that money? And how are you going to run a profitable operation with that kind of revenue? Those, I would say, are the four most important questions because it's about whether you can actually sell the thing in a feasible manner and whether you have a company that is acceptable, um, you know, like can actually run on that. So, you know, you can have a great idea about, you know, we're going to skip out free shoes, but you're not really going to be able to run a company based on the idea of free shoes. So, you know, obviously you'd have to work on that. So that's what I would say is go to market strategy is really just about, can I take this idea and actually translate it into a successful company with customers and with employees and with hopefully enough money in the bank account to pay those employees. Perfect. Uh, thank you for that. And I think we've got like two more minutes left. So picking up this question, how can I launch my product and service-based company uh, when I don't have enough funds? Uh, so is there any way any way to do it without any money. So for example, if um, the, the platform I'm using for my consulting company, I built that with a no code platform. So I didn't have to pay a developer. Um, I built that myself. It was like $100 a month to, um, to, to, for the platform fees. So it was, it's, it's not free, but it was a lot cheaper than having that. And my thought is, you know, I'm trying to build that, get it started. Eventually I'll get enough, hopefully enough revenue from that to hire a developer. So shrink your idea and shrink your your concept to the absolute minimum if is it like you know say um zappos the shoe company where you don't all you need is a website and you can go do everything else yourself um it, another way to do it is to start it with basically a consulting business so maybe you're selling a product but uh, let's say you're selling uh web website templates and you don't have the money to make automatic templates well you could you know manually create website templates based on what uh, customers want, sell those so it's effectively a service-based company. And then once you have enough money, you invest in productizing those services. Um, there's, there's a number of ways to do it. For some things, it's really hard. Like you, really, you can't do a biotech company without capital. That's just impossible. But if it is software, if it's manufacturing, if it's something else, um, there's probably a way that if you minimize it enough, you can get away with something. Thank you. Thank you for that, Chris. Um, there's one question. Do we need to have a risk assessment uh, for our business model um, during the pandemic? Okay. For pandemic is the question, but I think during the pandemic uh, could be. Yeah. yeah, I would say you definitely need to. And just because my consulting firm is political risk, you should probably have a risk assessment for everything. Um, think about, you know, why is it that you're, company is successful or could be successful right now and think about what in the world could change that would affect that so for me you know i'm i'm in the software business so if um for example every company had a data sovereignty plan 
and you needed to have all of your data stored within the same country, well, then it would be, a, I'd still be, I could still be successful, but it'd be a lot higher cost because every single country I'm in, I would need to do data sovereignty. If it's that the federal government says no elected official is going to be able to use email because they're so insecure, well, okay, that's a much bigger threat than me. So definitely, I would say go through your business uh, model or your go-to-market strategy and think what, uh, basically, what in the world are the assumptions that are underpinning that? And what would have what would have to happen to make them change? And that's I mean that's what I do in my political risk workshops. But that's the basic ideas. What in the world uh, are you assuming is going to stay the same to make your company successful? And is there a chance that those assumptions wouldn't hold either because the government changes, the law changes, the regulation changes, a pandemic hits, people can't go out, anything like that? Go through and then what's your plan B if that happens? Plan C, Plan D, etc. Perfect. I know we've gone out of time with just one question. Yeah, how do I? Uh, how do I make sure our uh, the the pilot that we've made, essentially the beta, uh, presents opportunities for growth? Maybe you get a good response, right, from from the user. But what? How do I understand that there's more growth to this? Yeah. So whenever you're doing a pilot or a beta or something like that. Think about what it, what's the feedback, what's the information you want to get from it, and then how will you use that information? So for me, for example, in my beta test, if I find out that uh, state employees don't like it and municipal employees love it, well, then my, uh, my next strategy is to really engage with the municipal employees and to build whatever features are needed for the state employees. Um, you know, I have two market segments that I'm going to, and so that's really what I'm trying to do. So before you even launch your pilot, Think to yourself, what is what is it that I really need to, to learn from this? Um, and in many ways, it's like you're conducting an experiment. What's your hypothesis? The hypothesis shouldn't be that this is going to does this work or not. The hypothesis should be: uh, is this what market segment is this most appealing to? What are my profit margins on this? Um, something like that. So really break it down to that. And so whatever happens with your pilot program, you have more information you can pivot and iterate, and then you can keep building from there. Because really what you're trying to do, your pilot is step one, and we don't know what your step two is, but you should be thinking in advance, what are the possibilities for step two, and trying to test which one it is you can take. In many ways, it's like uh, you have four or five possible step twos, and your pilot should be telling you which is the correct answer to, to follow. Amazing. Thanks, Chris. We've, I think we've got two more questions on the Q&A box. Do you think you want you yeah you yeah let's do it. yeah uh there's one on i want to start my own um, online printing t-shirt company uh yep. and i mean any suggestions how to sell it online i would say uh you know what kind of t-shirts um are you selling is it music t-shirts if so talk to bands and try to give them a cut of it um if it's for corporate t-shirt printing where do they usually buy? What's the usual margin? So definitely target in on that initial market. Um, absolutely. Um, I, yeah, I see another uh, another question about um, for an Amazon affiliate, and I, I I just don't know anything really about Amazon affiliates. Sorry. Um, uh, we'll be distracted. Um, but I do. There's a great one here that I do want to ask before we leave. How to overcome from the situation of the failure of a startup? This is something that probably everyone's going to have to deal with. Um, at some point. And I'd say there's two things. There's one is that the startup just failed like two or three years into it because it just didn't work. And unfortunately that happens and you just have to shut down the company and declare bankruptcy and, you know, hopefully get a, get a different job. I'd say in my mind, the best thing is if your startup fails, try to get a real job for a while so that you don't have to, because it's a very intense experience. And I've, I've heard from people that when a startup fails, it's like you know losing a family member because you just put so much effort into it. So maybe get get a real job for a little bit, um, but also try to learn from it because especially if it's you have a startup and you develop the product, maybe you developed on your own and uh, you didn't really take any money, but you put a lot of effort into it and it just didn't work. Well, okay, that's not necessarily a failure. That's more information that that particular approach didn't work. And yeah, maybe you ran out of money for that and maybe you got to like shut it down and start up a new company. But there are a lot of ways in which a lot of people, especially who have had a startup, it didn't work out. They took their, um, 
their lumps, they learned from it, and then they built something new and, and even better. You know, Mark Zuckerberg had, uh, well, he got in trouble with his university for his first software products, but he just kept building stuff and eventually one worked. Um, you know, nine out of 10 startups fail. So if you build 10 startups over the course of your life, there's a chance that one of them might work out. So I'd say don't give up, but also you don't, don't, don't be the, I guess, don't be the type of person that just launches startups kind of like every other day, they, they have a new startup and a new idea. Definitely focus on one, try to build it, try to make it successful, but realize that, and, and I know this myself, like it might not work out and you have to be able to go to the people that if they did invest in you, gave you money that you could say at the beginning, we know it's likely not to work out. Are you okay with losing all your money? And just, I, and I, I may have to go back to them in a, a year if legislator doesn't work out or two lanterns bombs uh, and say, you know, Hey, I lost all your money and I'm really sorry, but here's what we learned. And I'm going to start a new one. Or if I do start a new one, I'll let you know, or, uh, you know, whatever, because it's, it's a tough, uh, it's a tough world. It's a tough environment. And the best, the best thing to do is just before you start that startup is to learn as much as you can about the world you're doing it. Learn as much as you can about how to run a business, about how to do fundraising, about how to build the product. If you do need to build the product, about how to do your go-to-market side, any kind of marketing, any skill that you will need, take the time beforehand to learn about it so that at the very least, you know you're going into that startup with the best chance to succeed possible. And don't ever stop learning when you're there because the best thing to do is uh, you don't want to have to go to someone and say, I lost all your money, but it's a lot easier if you say, I did everything I possibly could right. I really worked hard. I learned as much as I could. It just didn't work out rather than saying like, oh yeah, I built your product, but I never took a marketing class. So no customers bought our stuff. That's a much harder conversation to have. So definitely do as much learning, as much thinking, as much working. And uh, hopefully you'll, yeah, you'll be at Davos one day, um, hanging out with Elon Musk, but who knows? At the very least, you'll hopefully have a product that people like and that helps make their life better. Great. That last, last question sort of was like an amazing pep talk uh, from you. So thanks, Chris, for that. And and I hope that was really helpful to the person who asked the question and to everybody who attended it. Uh, thanks for so patiently answering all the questions. Uh, Okay, if we see one more question, uh, you want to take that up before we close it? Sure. What is it? It is how to connect with angel investors and VCs. I don't have any networks. I didn't either, really. Um, I guess I had one, but um, reach out. Just do a lot of Googling about angel investors in your area, venture capitals, uh, who invest in the sector that you're investing in. Go through uh, university accounts, go through you know, high school accounts, if there's local city groups or any, any other, anything that you are connected to, try to do that. And if there is no connection to any of them, just cold email and you know, all you need really is one check to get started. So cold email and don't be afraid to ask for money because um, that's, it is weird. It is kind of weird. Not, we're, I don't know about you, but I, I was never raised to like go and just ask people, hey, can you pay me? fifty thousand dollars for an idea i have but in the startup world that is what you do because they know the score they know it's a risk um and you just have to put yourself out there and try to get get on their radar right i i do remember one of my friends trying to raise money from from a school principal so yeah. it was it was a great idea i mean nobody would have ever thought oh you go back to you know 15 years in your life and raise it from somebody who really knew you back then uh, worked out for him. I, I'm sure um, worth a try. Yeah, I, I I got a cold email from a guy I went to high school with. It was the year below me. I didn't. I mean, I was kind of friends with him, but I didn't know him that well. And he just sent out an email blast like, "I'm investing in this musical that's going to be on Broadway. Um, do you want to be a, as part of it?" And I was like, "Well, sorry, I didn't." But I guess he got enough investment, and that went on to be the Book of Mormon, which is one of the most uh, most successful musicals in Broadway history. And I assume he's got a lot of money now. Um, so uh, yeah, just an email to everyone you know is as a last resort, not actually a bad idea. Okay, great. Uh, thanks a lot, Chris. Thank you so much, everybody, uh, for for this amazing, amazingly interesting and engaging session. And uh, for any other questions you have, please write to us at admissions at the rate upgrade.com. Do visit our website, upgrade.com and uh, see out if you find any other course that interests you. And uh, Chris, looking forward to another session. I, I really enjoyed myself doing this. 
Absolutely. Yeah. And uh, reach out to me uh, if anyone has any other questions, uh, please get in touch. Um, Cause yeah, it's a uh, startup is a weird world. And yeah, the, the more, the more you learn about it, the more, the more you learn in general, the better. Perfect. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank Have you a great evening. Thank you. Good evening, everyone.